Number 10, the cube. All right, Transformers fans, let's do this. I feel like we're hearing more about these things like UFOs or UAPs, whatever you wanna call them now. I feel like we're hearing about them now more than ever. So why not kick this weird list off with something off world? We have to include some alien cover-ups, right? It's me, it's Taylor, why not? I figured that I'd find one that's also not too well known. We haven't seen this one, you know on YouTube all the time. Not too long ago, this spinning cube looking craft or drone or something, it was spotted over Missouri, just lurking in the same spot, just hovering. And then it would zoom off. Folks could see it with their naked eye on the ground. It was also pretty obvious. It was eye grabbing, it was shiny in the sky. Only a couple hours later, it was seen again, but this time it was 700 miles away. This time it was 44 year old Matthew Jandeka. He was minding his own business, hanging out on the porch, just doing his you know Sunday, Sunday stuff. When this cube, again, this floaty cube caught his attention. It was a sunny day, the light reflecting off the cube caught his eye, but then a day later, another guy, 30 year old Justin Johnson, he saw the same thing. But this time he saw it while he was driving home, which is also pretty distracting. The light and the reflections also caught his eye. He says, at first I thought maybe it was a balloon, but the movements were too odd. In a world full of deep fakes, I mean, do we believe this account? Is this real? Lately everyone's talking about how these UFOs are spheres, so maybe this video is that of a sphere. Not a cube. That's cool. I love teaching geometric shapes via alien aircraft. I'm like, this is a triangle. We saw this one in the Navy. Then we saw this cube in the sky. Number nine, Amityville photo. Okay, we'll go less UFOs, more ghosts. One M. Night Shyamalan theme to the other. Here we go. This photo was taken inside the actual Amityville house back in 1976. It's a young man, it appears, with glowing white eyes. How comforting is that? Pretty, pretty hard to miss there. He's got the glowing... Yeah, it looks very Sin City of him, just to stare with those white eyes. Now, at first, I thought this was from a horror movie, right? All those Amityville knockoffs. It looks obviously fake or set up in some way, until you start to read about the details here. See, this photo, it was taken with automatic cameras equipped with infrared, not an actual person. So, this young lad here probably wasn't expecting a selfie. Why I wasn't smiling or throwing up a peace sign. Makes sense now. Photographer Gene Campbell set up the photo and took it back in 1976. Now, at the time, Gene was working with paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren on the actual case. Huh. I'm scared now. This photo was revealed three years after it was taken on the Merv Griffin show, and many believe this is the ghost of John DeFeo, one of the victims in 1974. Now, you can't really do this anymore, right? You can't whip out photos from a otherwise crime scene and be like, okay gang, what do we think? Spirit or not a spirit? Vote, yes, no. Obviously there was backlash after this for obvious reasons, but it took three years for that photo to reach the public eye, and now everybody believes in ghosts, or they do a little more than they did before that show. This was long before The Conjuring movie as well, obviously, so this was quite random to see on TV. Do you believe in ghosts? What's the ratio here? Comment down below. I'm not a believer, I'm not gonna lie. I've tried numerous times. I got the Ouija board, did the whole thing. Felt nothing, man. Like an 18 year old on Christmas. I'm like, is that it? Is it done? Do I have to feel anything anymore? Number eight, Alfred Hitchcock and the MGM Lion. All right, you're gonna hear me roar after this one. This photo was from 1958. You've seen this at some point, right? Hopefully, or else, you know, we'll send over a VHS, we'll help you out. It was taken by Clarence Sinclair Bull. Now the photo appears to be, well, no, it doesn't appear to be at all. It's Alfred Hitchcock serving tea to a lion. Yeah, the famous MGM lion. His name's Leo, that's him, there he goes, he's getting tea. He loves suspense and tea, who would have thought? And company, it appears. North by Northwest was the only film that Hitchcock did with MGM. So there's a rumor now that he directed the lion's roar for the MGM intro, which is fun. But you're also like, okay, that's a real animal, that's kinda, that's sad. And also, that's probably nonsense. There have been seven MGM lions in total. Yeah, not just one, but Leo was known to be the most friendly. I wanna hear about the other six. I'm like, what happened there? He's still in the logo today. Today, but again, back in the 1950s, it's hard to say what it was really like on set. I mean, it's still a lion being held down for a photo, so probably wasn't a friendly vibe for that fella. In our number seven spot today, we have the Tsar Bomba. This is a photo that was taken on October 30th, 1961. It was quite the Halloween spooky fright that year, as this is said to be the largest and most powerful nuclear weapon ever created and tested. The hydrogen aerial bomb was developed in the Soviet Union by a group of nuclear physicists that were under the leadership of Igor Kurchatov. The bomb was dropped by parachute and was detonated autonomously. While this test was meant to be a secret, turned out to be 
less than well kept, as it was obviously a huge explosion that was detected by United States intelligence agencies. A secret US recon aircraft called Speed Light Alpha was there monitoring the explosion, and it got so close that it had its anti radiation paint absolutely scorched off. The photo clearly shows the bomb as it exploded, and it is said that this bomb was 5,000 times stronger than the ones that were dropped on Japan during World War II. That's not to say that those ones weren't strong because they were absolutely devastating, it's just an example to show how large this one really was. In our number 6 spot today we have the 3 Jacksons. On August 21st, 1934, 3 fearless acrobats known as the 3 Jacksons, Charlie Smith, Jewel Waddick and Jimmy Kerrigan all performed a routine on the edge of the Empire State Building which is when this photo was captured. It is said that these 3 toured as an acrobatic trio and this stunt the photo captured was done at 1,245 feet. According to officials from the Empire State Building, it is said that this was the first time the stunt was attempted and to this day it has never been done again. Which makes a lot of sense. While this photo is absolutely incredible and is such a testament not only to the trust that they shared but also their abilities as acrobats, I don't know who in their right mind would try to recreate this. We already have one, I think we can just all be happy with that. In our number 5 spot today we have the Gentleman of Rehi. This photo shows the Gentleman of Rehi and that is not a gentleman and instead is the world's oldest surviving diving suit. It is an absolutely terrifying sight but also an important pillar that allowed for this kind of technology to Develop to what it is today. The suit date backs to the early 18th century, but it came to find its home at the Rehi Museum during the 1860s after it was donated. The suit was initially designed to allow people the ability to check the hull of ships without having to bring them into dry dock. The old gentleman is made mostly of leather with pitch thread used to stitch the seams. From here, the suit is sealed with more pitch, and then to create the waterproof coat, it is covered in a mixture of mutton tallow, tar, and pitch. Of course, underwater pressure in increases dramatically and this is why there's also wooden framework in the hood in order to keep it from collapsing under the pressure. At the top of the hood there is an opening for a wooden air pipe. The air would be pumped to the diver, then it could be released from the suit through a pipe on the backside. Of course this means that the suit wasn't completely watertight so divers could only go under for a short period and couldn't dive very deep because there was only so much pressure the suit could take, but still the suit was far better than having no suit at all. In our number 4 spot today we have ectoplasm. This photo is said to have been taken in 1910 and it shows a medium in the middle of a spiritual seance. I don't know about you, but a 1910 seance sounds like an absolutely terrifying time. This photo is said to be catching the moment that ectoplasm appears out of the mouth of the medium. When we're talking about the occult and the paranormal, ectoplasm is a viscous substance that exudes from a spiritual entity or sometimes the earthbound medium who is connected to or communicating with the spirit. It is said that this substance can take the shape of a face or a hand or a complete body and it's usually seen in a darkened room during a sort of seance. And this is the way that the paranormal can physically manifest themselves in our world. So basically, what I'm saying is that this is supposed to be the moment that an evil entity is making themselves known in our world. Thankfully, at the end of the contact with the spirit, the ectoplasm will usually disappear as it returns to the entity, so it hopefully didn't stay around long, but this photo sure is something. In our number 3 spot today, we have the isolator. There are tons of strange inventions from the past. We have entire lists and videos dedicated to the strange inventions, there's so many. And while this is one that can be added to the list of bizarre inventions, it can also be added to the list of creepy ones as well. This photo shows what was meant to be a sort of anti-distraction contraption from the 1920s. Listen. I can get easily distracted, so sometimes I need a little help, but this thing really takes it to a new level. It essentially makes it impossible for the person to look at anything other than what is directly in front of them, or you know, breathe. It seems like a contraption that requires an oxygen tank hookup probably isn't going to be the best anti-distraction device. In fact, I think that's probably more distracting than anything. Honestly, I'm such a good procrastinator that even with this thing, I still wouldn't get my work done. Thankfully, this device didn't stick around or gain much popularity, and now it is just a terrifying relic of the past. In our number 2 spot today, we have the Great Manta. In 1933, a New York silk manufacturer named A. L. Kahn was on a nice little vacation in Florida when he honestly accidentally caught something remarkable. His anchor line, by mistake, caught onto a giant manta ray. After a struggle and several hours, Khan was able to get this 
actually enormous fish ashore. This monster was somewhere between 5,000 to 6,000 pounds and it was 20 feet and 5 inches in width. For reference, there are other giant manta rays, but they usually grow to be around 13 to 14 feet wide, not 20 and a half. This photo is showing a taxidermy version of the fish, which Khan used to bring around to exhibitions to show off his accidental cache. In an article from December 10th, 1933, of the St. Louis Post Dispatch's Sunday magazine, Khan is quoted as saying, Fishing is a lot of fun when you catch the fish, and sometimes it's fun even when you don't, but when the fish catches you. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the advertisement. This is a photo that comes to us from the time of World War II, and it shows a very terrifying kind of ad. The sign reads, these men didn't take their adabrine. And at first I had absolutely no idea what that was. Turns out that adabrine was actually the first synthetic form of a drug which was used by the US military to fight malaria in the South Pacific during the war. It is estimated that as many as two thirds of the troops fell ill with malaria. The sign is said to have been posted outside of a military hospital in New Guinea and was meant to serve as a warning for those who didn't take the medicine, warning that the skulls on top would be the fate that awaited them. Perhaps a little dark, but creative and likely effective nonetheless. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens is a stratovolcano located in Skamania County, Washington. This volcano is best known for its huge and disastrous eruption on May 18, 1980. This photograph comes from photographer Robert Landsberg, who of course was in the area at the time of the eruption. Before the eruption, he had visited the area in order to photograph and document all of the changes that were happening. On May 18th, he was within a few miles of the volcano when it erupted. Since he unfortunately was located so close to the explosion, he knew he would be unable to escape this disaster, so instead of focusing on the impossible, he focused on taking as many pictures as possible. Robert was obviously incredibly brave and dedicated, but also very smart. After snapping as many photos as he could, including this one, he then secured his camera in his backpack and covered his backpack with his body. He knew he was unlikely to survive, but wanted to make sure that these photos did. His body was found 17 days later with his backpack still underneath him. His film was of course, um, his film was of course developed and has provided geologists with some really valuable insights with his close documentation of the eruption. In our number 9 spot today we have the core. This photo shows a physicist named Harold Agnew, and while this looks like a relatively normal, non-threatening photo, what he has in his hand is truly devastating. Harold is holding the nuclear core of what was nicknamed the Fat Man Atomic Bomb. This means that Harold is holding the nuclear core of the atomic bomb that was later dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. The immediate blast of course took many lives, but so did the long term effects of the bomb, like radiation illness and that sort of thing. It's crazy to look at a photo like this because it seems just so perfectly normal when he literally has a life changing, world ending device in the palm of his hand. Also, I don't think I could ever hold something like that. Not only would I just like not want to, but I would just be so afraid that something was gonna go wrong. In our number 8 spot today we have the Challenger crew. This is a photo that was taken of the clearly very excited Challenger crew as they walked down the ramp ready to head off on their mission. The crew even included 37 year old Krista McAuliffe who was a high school social studies teacher. She had won a spot on this mission through a program with NASA called the Teacher in Space program and she had trained diligently for months in order to be the first non-military person in space. On January 28th, 1986, the Challenger Challenger mission proved to be fatal just 73 seconds after liftoff. Two rubber O-rings failed because of the cold temperatures of the morning and on live television the world watched as the spacecraft broke apart and plunged into the ocean, sadly taking the lives of everyone on board. It is an absolutely tragic event made even more chilling by this final photo. Our next photo is of an undeserving celebrity. Why? Because the reason he's a celebrity is so extremely twisted that it blows me away and I don't mean an undeserving in a Kim Kardashian made a family of talentless people famous through adult video kind of way, I mean in a seriously sick, twisted, criminal, undeserving way. I'll only be calling this man IS, as I do not believe any more infamy should be granted. The photo you see was from a Japanese magazine after he was released from prison due to insanity. IS killed Dutch born Renee Harveld, and the two were studying in Saborn, Paris. He chose to do this because of her health and her beauty characteristics that he felt he lacked. IS considered himself weak, ugly, and 
small and claimed he wanted to absorb her energy through, well, he had her body for three days. I'll simply let you piece together what I mean when I say that he had a considerable amount of this body missing and a very interesting fridge contents. But like I said, he was released. So how can you kill someone whilst on a student visa, desecrate remains, and then also do some pretty horrific acts posthumously? He is from a very wealthy Japanese family and they somehow managed to get him released. Also, they paid the victim's parents a huge sum of money for the loss. That's the world we live in. After his release, he was frequently on talk shows, reviewed restaurants for magazines, and appeared in horror films. He even wrote a book on the murder of Renee. This next photo shows us you never know what could be just a reach away. This photo looks relatively normal. Now obviously it's not gonna be, it's on this list and the fact that it's titled about reaching out to something, well, Sarah Funk who you see here on the waterline is a YouTube vlogger who's on a trip to Cyprus's Red Lake. And you can see her literally like two feet away from a suitcase lodged in the waterbed. It's two years after this photo is taken in 2019 that the drifting suitcase is retrieved and opened to reveal the corpse of a girl. She is one of seven known victims of serial killer Nikos Mexata, whose signature was doing body dumps in suitcases. It's believed the reason this case was retrieved in the first place was due to previous sightings of it in the water once other victims of Nikos had started to be found and identified at the same time period. Sarah Funk has since commented on what it's like to know that she was so close to a body without being aware. I thought it was a log at the time, but in retrospect, I realized it wasn't. This is a completely fair explanation. As you can see from that picture, the case was incredibly dirty and hard to identify even as a briefcase. This man is the first recorded serial killer on the island of Cyprus and is currently serving seven life sentences in central prison. Our next photo is recreating time, pun is intended. The photo you see on screen is very peculiar, but not the most outlandish. It's a man standing shirtless behind the fence in a summer afternoon, looking like something out of an old country family album of sorts. His name is Fikrek Alik, and he was photographed in this exact spot for a Time magazine cover back in 1992. You are quite literally looking twice with these images. Emaciated, it's almost hard to recognize him. Fikrat can be seen holding his t-shirt in one hand and reaching with his other through the barbed wire to take someone's hand. This is during the Bosnian War from 1992 to 95, and Fikrat was one of many prisoners held in camps at the time. This recreation of the Time magazine cover was taken in the mid-2000s, and the building behind him now is a community center without any plaques or memorials of the victims of the notorious prisoner camps in Bosnia. This region is now under the rule of the same faction that was responsible for the camp, so they engage in a lot of historical denials and concealing. Fikrat's story remains one of incredible perseverance, especially as he and other victims still go before the UN today in battle to have reparations and acknowledgement. This vintage photo isn't so vintage, but it's old enough, so I'm counting it. It's bad Santa. This early 2000s family Christmas photo reps a normal looking scene. White picket fence family, the itchy velvet Christmas dresses, the big sparkly tree, and the serial killer Santa. That there is Bruce MacArthur. In the warm seasons, he is a landscaper, but working in the Agincourt Mall as Santa during the holidays. Between 2010 and 2017, he terrorized the gay village district of Toronto, Ontario. Luring men in through dating apps, he killed and disposed of eight individuals in the planter boxes of properties he managed. For a long time in the community, people had known someone was taking gay men off the street, but the Toronto police were resistant in believing something was suspicious. I remember myself seeing posts on Reddit and Twitter mere months after the first of the disappearances, frustrated with the lack of police action and urging the community members to stay alert. It takes multiple victims and community engagement for police to start an investigation and it's thankfully in the nick of time. They'd been watching Bruce for a while before his arrest when they saw a young man enter his place. After about a half hour of nothing, they decide to make the risk to move in for an arrest. When they entered the unit, the young man was tied up and unconscious and they caught Bruce in the act. No way to plead guilty, my guy. He's found guilty of eight counts of first degree murder. Our next vintage photo is one that speaks to a still in modern times, a determined mother. This photo was taken on Mother's Day. The woman in it is Margie, a 23 year old, and she's holding her infant son while attempting to hitchhike. As you can see, it was printed in a newspaper column and has a subject line describing Margie's struggle with her husband Mike to find an apartment. I imagine that struggle alongside the fact that she is hitchhiking likely correlates with financial difficulties. Unfortunately, Margie's luck never got better. This is very likely the last photo of Margie alive. Less than four months later, she was killed by her husband Mike during a fight. In the time between this photo and her demise, their son Brandon had been taken away and put into foster care, where he was later adopted by his foster parents after Margie's sudden death. Little information exists on the photo other than this and on what Brandon's life became. This is still recent enough history that some may recognize the story, the manifesto man. This photo seems so simple. A man appears to be in a wetsuit, he has multiple police badges displayed, and he sits in a stoic manner. This is no cop. In fact, this photo was taken after his arrest in July of 2011 for killing 
77 people and injuring 250. Anders Behring had a manifesto for killing political enemies as a far right extremist, first killing 8 people outside the tower block housing of the office of the prime minister. The method used caused distraction, enough for Anders slipping away in a police disguise to pull part 2 of his plan, which is hop in the ocean and swim to political youth swing summer camp just starting the season. He chose the summer camp for the politicians who came to visit the camp, which was for members of political youth adult clubs and organizations for co-ops, school courses, or just special interest in politics. Once on the island, well, he opened fire. Many who were afraid and unsure of where the danger was coming from went towards Anders for safety due to his police costume and received the opposite. His verbalized intent that day was to kill everyone he could and thankfully he did not succeed. But some swam away and were rescued by people staying at campgrounds across the water who brought out boats to pull everyone out. Others hid in various places on the island. Netflix released the film 22nd of July about this event in Oslo, and the movies White Rage and Brave Hearts also tell the story. Ultimately, this event only took place due to Anders' racist ideology, believing Norwegian politicians were lenient on immigrants. Let's talk about the most disastrous hostage crisis our world might have ever seen, the Gladbeck hostage bus. The 1988 crisis in Gladbeck, Germany it was the kind of disaster you don't see often. In this photo, you'll see a robber left and a hostage right taken on the last day of the situation. Day 1, two dudes rob a bank and take some hostages. They demand a getaway car and took two hostages and then stopped for one of the robber's sisters casually on the way as reporters follow. Day 2, the same robbers hijack a bus with 32 passengers. Whilst holding out in the bus, they allow reporters some entry to interview them. One robber even came outside the bus for an interview like an MTV crib situation but with hostages. The robbers state that their stance is that they don't care what happens because they'd simply take their own lives anyway if it all went wrong. Obviously this is a sign for police to maybe, I don't know, handle with a lot of caution. And like tossing stones at glass houses, caution was non-existent. When the robbers take off in the bus, once again followed by police and reporters just doing nothing, the robber's sister is arrested by police at the first gas station they stop at. Her arrest causes the robbers to lash out and kill a hostage so the police release her and go back to doing nothing. After this, the road trip crosses jurisdictions into Netherlands. The Dutch police are now involved and they demand the release of any young hostages on board with the promise of a BMW in return. The robbers took two hostages with them in the BMW and drove back to Germany. Later on, they were surrounded by a lot of media reporters who took a lot of pictures of the scene which can be found in Google. That is where our photo of the hostage and the robber was taken. Finally, the German police after days of this make a move that isn't just following the robbers like a lost puppy. They rammed the hostage car, causing a crash. One of the hostages flees off the highway as police and robbers engage their firearms. The woman in our photo, Silky Bischoff, is sadly caught in the crossfire. The driving robber said later in an interview that the bullets came from a policeman, but the German police denies that and says that the bullets came from the robbers and hit the hostage. No matter what, the one thing I can say about this whole story is what the f was anyone trying to accomplish here? First up is captured in a card. Alrighty, so you see this basketball card here. So centered, we've got Mark Jackson back in 89 playing a Knicks game. But over here in the far left background, we have familiar faces of Lyle and Eric Mendez. In 1990, the Mark Jackson NBA hoops card went into circulation. A year after the two Mendez brothers depicted in the background killed their parents for life insurance in August of 1989. The brothers claimed a massive payout that allowed them to live a luxurious life lifestyle, spending money on expensive watches, clothes, and cars. Among the items that they bought were tickets to a basketball game at Madison Square Garden, where they would eventually be immortalized on an NBA card. To make it a little creepier, logistically, this moment captured would have been between when they killed their parents and when they were arrested. Speaking of sports, there's such a thing as the wrong time to cheer, which is our next photo. See, this is Mike Hawthorne and Ivor Bueb celebrating with champagne after winning the 24H Le Mans. Look at the revelry and the glory between these men. Those around them have a completely different vibe, however. We've got an arrangement of meme expressions going on here. Homeboy in the back holding the book is giving a hell of a judgmental side eye, and we have a signature auntie are you serious expression going on. See, while these men are ecstatically celebrating their win, what isn't captured in this photo was that the raceway was covered in ambulances and fire trucks. Hawthorne had driven an opponent off the track and the resulting accident killed 84 people, most of which were spectators. Videos of this event on YouTube are kinda insane to watch, not even because of the crash or the arrogance of the winners, but the announcer is so painfully cheery it's out of place, using an old timely projection system to shout, oh women and children are dying, whole families are wiped out, but most of the finishing cars were British, a fine achievement.
achievement in this abhorrent tragedy. It feels like a fever dream. Mountain climb to heaven is next. Because if you climb Mount Everest, let's be realistic, all you're doing is making your inevitable trip to heaven a little shorter of a distance upwards. Giving yourself and the creator a little shortcut, you know? Alright, so this photo has the same visual quality as some loosely scattered cat litter, but I'm sure you can make out that we've got these silly little tents here. Man, look how far tents have come. As well as these two dudes and what it looks like high socks. This is the 1924 British Mount Everest expedition. We've talked about a few Mount Everest climber groups and things that have happened to them in a few of our videos, so you may be familiar with this one from our channel. That or literally any Mount Everest movie. They tend to either pick one specific story to document or mismatch all of them together for one plot and then throw Jake Gyllenhaal up on a mountain. Anyways, this photo was taken of George Mallory and Sandy Irvin shortly after they made their ill-fated attempt to get to the summit. While Mallory's body is found literally decades later in 1999, the body of Irvin never has been. Number 7. Gloria Steinem Oh, here we go, a scandalous one. Back in 1963, the Playboy Club in New York City was booming. It was one of Hugh Hefner's greatest accomplishments at the time. This club was the talk of the town, that is until Gloria Steinem came in and started reporting some stuff. Gloria was a feminist writer, she's an icon, she created Miss Magazine back in 1972, but her career began much earlier around the 60s. See, she got a job as one of these Playboy bunnies, you know. Must be a comfortable get up. And she worked at the club undercover, secretly taking note on how this key holders only <sighs> establishment was operating, right? Cool, what's going on in here? What's the big scoop here? The staff were these young women, these beautiful young women, these bunnies. They had to wear the black bodysuits, the puffy white tails, the whole get up. And at age 28, Gloria worked undercover there for three weeks straight. And the piece she released after, appropriately titled A Bunny's Tale, Great title, by the way. She nailed that one. It got so much attention that it kickstarted her freelance career and also made her a feminist icon. This photo of Gloria undercover shows you the comfortable work outfits she had to endure just to get the story out. Yeah, doesn't look like she had her non slips on there. That's that's a write up in my books. In a collection of her writings, Gloria reflects on the undercover piece, saying that it now has outlived all of the Playboy clubs, both here and abroad. That was before Hefner passed away in 2017, so I will add that you also outlived. Him as well. Good, he wasn't a very nice lad. Let's move on. Number six, North Sentinel Island. All right, we've got some people, some aliens, some ghosts. What else do we need, Taylor? How about some weird islands? Sure. North Sentinel Island. We gotta head over to India for this one. This island is the home of the Sentinelese tribe. You've probably heard about this at some point. One of the most forbidden islands in the world, but why? Located in the Bay of Bengal, North Sentinel Island is about 1,200 kilometers away from India. And while most islands are shrinking, this one actually grew back in 2014. Yeah, the universe is like more. Yeah, you need more of this, sure. The island lifted up a couple of meters during an earthquake, so the west and south sides, they gained an extra kilometer. Nice. DLC unlocked. The inhabitants on this island are among the few uncontacted tribes left in the world. They have apparently been there for 50,000 years, and there's no sign of agriculture or even fire. Yet somehow this tribe has thrived for ages. Now, if we try and get close, they will try and drive anybody away. More than fair. Like, we have enough room. We're good. Let's just leave. In fact, back in 2006, two fishermen sadly lost their lives because they got too close to the island without knowing who was on it or what the island was. Yeah, you can't just approach random islands. You gotta do some homework. That's why I'm here. Number five. Lascaux Cave. If you didn't visit this cave back in 1963 or sooner, well, you lost your chance because, well, humans ruin everything. Now we can't even see ancient art anymore because, well, it's too many of us. The Lascaux Cave system is now a World Heritage Site in France, but once it was a booming tourist attraction. These cave paintings, see, they're 17,300 years old. They're quite ancient. We can't really touch them. You can't have someone write Steve was here on it. Can't do that. Paintings that depict cattle, bison, stags, you name it. They're beautiful. They're complex. And of course, like I said, they're extremely old. So old, in fact, that the cave was closed to the public forever in 1963 after it declared human presence wasn't healthy for the the art. Yeah, our dirty coffee breath would eventually cause this art to fade away. So we had to hold our breath. We gotta leave. We gotta close it off. There we go. Plus, I'm sure somebody would have snuck in with a Sharpie by now and ruined it. You know what I mean? Or like graffiti. It would have been gone by now. You know it. 7,000 year old paintings. Yeah, protect these for another 17,000 years, please. Number four. Surtsey Island, another fun island, another weird story. Here we go. When it comes to new things in life, it's pretty rare that we get a new island, right? Especially on our planet when we're losing things and melting. How lucky are we? Sure. We're even luckier that Disney didn't build a resort here first because now scientists, now they get a chance to study what an island looks like without human interaction. That's a fun little project to 
focus on in the future. That's cool. It's pretty cool. It's weird and scary, but it's cool, I guess. Yeah, I'm kind of nervous. I don't know. Surtsey Island in Iceland, as of right now, it's only open to a few scientists and geologists. Everybody else, Beat it, go find your own island, get out of here. It was born from a volcanic eruption back in 1963 and scientists, they have one rule on this island, don't talk about Fight Club. And the second rule is no seeds. Yeah, no life, no chance at life at all. Choose something else, anything else, please. One guy accidentally pooped out a tomato seed and he almost ruined the whole operation. Guy almost ruined this entire plan. What a stressful job, it's so eerie to see the oldest human history and then immediately after see a new island where humans are forbidden. It's like, we're not allowed to go and be places anymore. I'm kind of uh, not, that's not great. What are we doing here? I'm just breathing on things, I can't take a sh this island? Number three, Spaceman. Look, we've all been photobombed before. It's a blessing in disguise. You look back at prom photos, some dude's trying to do a moonwalk in between, his face is like melting this way. It's great, you're like, ah, classic Jeff. It's the best. But when Jim Templeton took a photo of his daughter in a otherwise empty marsh long before Photoshop existed, and yet somehow there appears to be an astronaut in the background, well, that's not very fun, is it? That's a little bit concerning. Jim assures us that nobody was around when this photo was taken, which I of course believe, because why would you put your kid in a photo with whatever that is? That's, no, no thank you, it's not a weird, we're not gonna go and talk to that guy. Also, the fact that this man looks like he's from space. That ought to do it, that makes him more weird and believable. What are we looking at right now? I have no idea. Kodak even got involved in the story, like, Kodak. Not Kodak Black, like the company, they got involved. They confirmed this photo was not tampered with. Yeah, and that's Kodak, right? They don't lie about anything. Spider-Man League, Kodak's like, nah, it's Andrew Garfield. Don't listen to that. So authentic, can confirm. Number two, nursing home spirit. This photo was taken from a nursing home resident the same night that another resident had passed away, which is an odd thing to do, just set up a camera thing right after. You're like, yeah, just in case, you know, maybe we'll catch one. Well, they did. This was back in 2015, and that night they heard a door open and close, but there were no visitors allowed at the time, so, you know, some, some Kodak was coming into the picture at this point. So now there's a great amount of people who think that this image is one of two things. It's either the spirit of the resident that passed away, or it's the Grim Reaper. Yeah, the door opening and closing, People think that was the Grim Reaper coming in and then leaving, which is so scary. How long was he in there? Was it like 46 seconds, four minutes? How long does this guy operate? Is he quick? Is it like busting tables? Is he just like, all right, let's do this. Is he like Santa Claus? I feel like he's like Santa Claus. A few comments were also saying that it's comforting, this photo, to know that in the end you aren't alone, that you have someone assisting you to the um, afterlife. No, I'm good. I'd rather die alone than have uh, whatever that is break into my home and closing open doors. I'm good. And finally, number one, the Battle of Los Angeles, or lack thereof. We'll see, I don't know, this is a weird one. Of course, we have to end on one of the most unspeakable battles, photos, whatever you wanna call it, of all time. The Battle of Los Angeles, otherwise known as the Great Los Angeles Air Raid, happened during World War II, right at the end of February 1942. Now, this event, first of all, took place only a few months after the Pearl Harbor attack, so I'll admit, everyone's a little on edge. We're a little stressed out, we've got some hands hovering over some buttons, we're a little nervous. Sure, something like 25 enemy aircraft was apparently spotted flying over Los Angeles in the late hours of February 24th. So, air raids then went off, blackouts were put in effect. This was not a drill, right? Or was it? What was this? This thing was getting lit up in the sky. Around 1,400 shells were blasted off and two people had a heart attack. That's how loud it was. In total, five people ended up dying from this retaliation and apparently it was a false alarm. Although many now believe that it was UFOs or aliens, and that's why we were launching stuff at it. A press conference was held by the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, and he called the incident war nerves. People have heart attacks. He's like, oops, I was nervous, my bad, slipped. A little quick reaction there. Number 10, demonic boy photo. All right, scary as hell right off the hop. It doesn't matter where or when, but odds are you've seen this photo at some point in your life. It's pretty haunting, it's kind of hard to forget. Check it out. You know when you see a photo, sometimes you just get bad vibes, like a registered in your brain as something real and scary. You want to find something about this photo that looks fake, but it's hard. This photo here was taken inside the Amityville house back in 1976, the real house. It appears to be a young boy with glowing white eyes. Kind of Kind of hard to forget. It was taken with automatic cameras equipped with infrared, so nobody actually took this themselves, it was just set up. It makes it even creepier that the boy looks like he's peeking 
around the corner. Makes my heart race just looking at that photo right there. A photographer named Gene Campbell operated this and got this photo. See, Gene was working with paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren at this time. The famous duo now rocking the big screen Conjuring Universe. They were on this case in real life. This photo was then revealed three years later on the Merv Griffin Show. Imagine tuning in watching TV on the Merv Griffin Show and then all of a sudden you see the ghost of John DeFeo. That's nice. Yeah, many believe this is the ghost of one John DeFeo, one of the boys who lived there prior to that 1974 horrible event. We're still trying to cover this. What do you guys think? Elaborate hopes or perhaps this photo is one solid piece of evidence that the Amityville house was and still is indeed haunted. Number nine, Svalbard Vault. Over the pandemic, I spent a lot of time playing video games. Chris and I actually just talked about video games for like eight minutes straight before we click record, so that's pretty funny. Some of my favorite games always have a similar theme. They always have this post apocalyptic feel. It's always just barren wasteland with like one dog as a survivor and you have to like go and eat scraps. Yeah, Fallout, it's a great game. There's shelters with survivors or even vaults. It's stressful, but it's engaging, right? Searching around. Now in real life, we do have a global seed vault and it's deep in the Arctic Circle on the island Spitsbergen. Now in this massive bunker that has since been deemed the Doomsday Vault, great name, really rolls off the tongue there. This is where humans will store food crops. It contains 100 million seeds. So if the earth all of a sudden, you know, gets wiped out, or even if all the ice melts and it floods and everything goes to quickly, this vault will still be good to go. All that water that just, you know, flooded the rest of humanity will then regrow the earth with all of these seeds, ideally. It sounds like a fun, cute way to get humans to think about the future. You're like, hey, throw some seeds in, make a wish. But I'm concerned. Is there something we don't know? How soon is this gonna happen? Why is everybody involved in this little seed heist? Number eight, Pluto's Gate. Number eight, Pluto's Gate. It rhymes, what's up? Also known as the Gate to Hell. <sighs> Hey, that's horrifying. These runes discovered in Turkey back in 1965 are beautiful, but they're also cursed. Historians believe that the site is the ancient city of Hierapolis. And if you're thinking about visiting these eerie ruins, well, you better leave the family pet at home. Yet yeah, any and all animal that enters these ruins, they also meet instant death. Sparrows were tossed in and then they immediately stopped breathing and they dropped. This was horrifying locals, so they had to resort to science. Scientists have figured out the solution and it's still pretty haunting. They measured the CO2 concentration and turns out while the sun is up, it burns away the gas. But at night, when the temperature drops significantly, the CO2 becomes heavier than that of air. Then it creates this deadly gas cloud on the floor. And then when the sun rises back up again, the concentration of CO2 hits 35%. So it's deadly enough for animals and sometimes even humans. Yeah, just stay away from anything called the gates of hell. How about that? It's pretty sound advice just to play it safe. In our number seven spot today, we have the plague. This photo comes from the 19th century, from the third plague pandemic. This was the first time that the plague had spread to all five continents. While we now know something about what that might have been like, what we haven't had to endure are the doctors that dressed like this. This is a photo of the outfits and masks that plague doctors wore when they would come to your house to treat or diagnose you. The long beak-like noses of the masks are very creepy, but they were used to hold herbs and other nicely scented things because they believed that it would help ward off the bad air, which at the time is what they thought was causing the sickness. A pandemic certainly is bad enough. Thankfully, our doctors and nurses are just sticking to scrubs. In our number six spot today, we have the elephant's foot. This photo looks like it's just a big lump of nothing, but it's called an elephant's foot. Don't worry, at first I was a little worried too, but it has nothing to do with elephants and is only named that because of its appearance. This lump was actually created from the Chernobyl nuclear meltdown, and it is just a mass of corium and other materials that were in the core of the reactor. This elephant's foot was located in the steam distribution corridor, which is under what's left of the reactor. While this mass doesn't produce as much radiation as it did before, it does still, to this day, produce a deadly amount. It is said that if you stood in front of it for just 300 seconds, that would be enough to get a lethal dose of radiation. It's kind of crazy that even though they knew this, they were still standing there taking pictures of it. But I'm just glad because we all now get to see it, and it gives us just a little more insight into what exactly happened that day. In our number five spot today, we have Mount Pinatubo. This is a photo that is showing Mount Pinatubo, which is located in the Philippines 
Philippines on June 15, 1991. That is the day that this volcano erupted into what would be the second largest volcanic eruption of the 20th century. Certainly impressive, also extremely terrifying. This photo shows the pyroclastic flow full of hot gas and rock being flung into the air. Eruptive activity in the volcano first started on April 2nd of that year, which prompted researchers to set up seismographs in the area. By June, the volcano was having a group of progressively shallower eruptions before, on June 12th, the volcano had its first spectacular eruption, which sent an ash column 19 kilometers up into the atmosphere. After more highly gas-charged magma reached the surface, on June 15th, the volcano once again exploded, this time sending the cloud of ash 40 kilometers up into the atmosphere. Volcanic ash and pumice blanketed the surrounding area, and pyroclastic flows filled what were once deep valleys with fresh volcanic deposits. It was truly magnificent and extremely powerful, and this photo shows just that. In our number four spot today, we have the Pioneer's Defense. This photo is known as the Pioneer's Defense, and Man, does it ever look creepy. This photo comes from 1937 and it was taken by a Russian photographer named Viktor Bulla. This photo takes place in the Leningrad area, which is now known as St. Petersburg, which is the second largest city in Russia. The people in this photo were part of a group that was the 1930s Russian equivalent of our Boy Scouts, and it was called the Young Pioneers. The masks on their faces leave a very eerie feeling, and for a fair reason. These people were doing a military preparation drill, which is the reason for the gas mask. This photo was taken during a time where the country was under the dictatorship of Joseph Stalin, and the residents were constantly unsure of what was going to happen. The country was already seeing death, and people were already frightened just a few years before the start of World War II. In our number three spot today, we have the lipstick. This is a photo that comes to us from December 10th, 1945. If looking at this image gives you a shudder down your spine, that absolutely makes sense, as it was written by a terrible person known as the lipstick killer. This photo is an image of a note he left written on the wall at one of his crime scenes. The photo comes from the apartment of Francis Brown, as just before he wrote this message, he took her life. After this message was left, he ended up taking the life of one other person before he was finally caught by police six months later. The message scrawled in the photo reads, quote, For heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. It is an absolutely chilling note with a horrifying backstory. In our number two spot today, we have the acid drum. This photo comes to us from inside the house of another terrible person, the serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer, made very famous recently. This photo was taken from the inside of his home after he was found out and caught by authorities. Before his arrest, he was sadly able to take the lives of 17 different people. Although this photo might look kind of plain, the horrors are plentiful. This shot shows a drum full of acid that was located inside of his home. Probably don't really need to tell you what it was used for. I can't imagine the horrors investigators saw when they entered his home, and even previous to that as they investigated his crimes. Thankfully, Jeffrey was caught, and in 1992, he was sentenced to life in prison, but just two years later, he was killed by a fellow prison inmate. In our number one spot today, we have the Dyatlov Pass Incident. If you have never heard of the Dyatlov Pass Incident, you better buckle in, because it is so terrifying. This photo was taken in February of 1959, as nine young Soviet hikers sent out to trek through the Ural Mountains. They had set up a camp, and some time during the night, something happened that made them cut their way out of the tent and all flee the site. Leaving in such a rush, they were of course underdressed for the bitterly cold weather, and six of them ended up passing away from hypothermia, which is extremely tragic. The other three, however, is where this story takes an even more frightening turn. Like I mentioned before, no one knows why they fled the tent in the first place, and the last three hikers were found passed away with severe signs of physical trauma that no one agreed on what had caused it. In 2019, the investigation was reopened, and just last year there was a conclusion that a kind of avalanche called a slab avalanche was the cause for these injuries. Before you come at me in the comments, I know that not everyone is convinced that's what happened, and I don't blame you. It's really strange. So, down below in the comments, let me know what you think. Let's solve this mystery once and for all together in the YouTube comments.
Regardless of what happened, this whole incident was of course very tragic, but the mystery behind it definitely takes it to a very spooky place. Number 10, Russian Bigfoot caught on tape. The exact location of where this video was taken is still unknown. In fact, there isn't a ton known about this video at all, but what is known is that it was taken somewhere in Russia. That's about it. And people actually believe that it captures the real Bigfoot or one of the many Bigfoots out there. This is the Russian one. They got a Russian Bigfoot. What do we all think here? I wanted to start with one of the most insane videos videos I could find. I think I nailed it. How'd I do? I don't know. This one comment dives in further. The user says, the title of the original video was called Chichuna, but in Russian script. The creature hops, sometimes sideways, like a lemur. Of course, lemurs have tails, which make that type of movement easier. And Chichunas are sometimes described as having tails, but this creature doesn't appear to have one, does it? No, it looks like a, a blob of scariness. I don't even know. The original footage was in all Russian and claimed to have been shot in Siberia. It also featured a boy and a dog in the foreground who didn't appear to be all that concerned, but I still believe this footage to be genuine. That's one of the top comments, so you know if someone did their research. Number nine, overnight visitor. Oh, this one definitely gives me the chills. I don't like it. This video was taken from a surveillance camera that was placed inside of a couple's home. Not outside, inside. This is scary, and this I hope this never happens to anybody watching this video. The footage caught something while they were both asleep, and it's one of the creepiest things that I've ever seen. When the couple woke up the next day, they were unable to find a purse that they knew was in the home right before they went to sleep. So they decided to check their security cameras, and this is what they found. As they were sleeping, a man crept in and was so quiet that he didn't wake them or their dogs up. No, he stood at the top of the stairs watching them sleep for a few minutes, which just adds another layer of Ew, to this whole scenario. Yeah, always check those nooks and crannies before you go to sleep, I guess. Number eight, Titanic inspection card. This inspection card once belonged to a woman named Marion Meanwell. What could possibly be creepy about an inspection card, you ask? Well, it shows how Marion was not intended to be on the Titanic, but by some turn of events, she unfortunately found herself as one of the passengers that went down with the ship. Now, the card shows that she was originally meant to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic. For some reason, the trip she originally had planned was delayed, and she instead was assigned to the ill-fated Titanic. Yeah, you can see the word majestic is literally crossed out of her card. You know, adds to the creepy element because it shows her literal change in plans. Number seven, Norway lights. Natural light phenomena is common in our big, beautiful planet. The northern lights, the green flash, solar eclipses, you name it. I bet those were all pretty alarming back in ancient times. Now, some of these natural events look otherworldly. They look cosmic, almost. Most of the time, there's an explanation waiting but for the mysterious glowing orbs floating over Norway, the Hasdell and Lights, as locals call them, we still need some answers. Scientists have been trying to gather research, and in 2014, after many impressive light shows, their best guess is a natural battery that charges underground, and then emits this light show above. Maybe this has something to do with the uh, reoccurring lights over Phoenix. Could be the same phenomena happening, who knows. Number seven, the Lady of Radom Hall. This one's a classic. If my grandma was still alive, she would have loved this one. If you haven't seen this photo, it's gonna live rent free in your head from here on out. This spirit is said to haunt Radom Hall in Norfolk, England. Nice. My old home. Not Norfolk, but I have English family. What's up? This tale kicked off back in 1936 after a photo went around through Country Life magazine. I guess that's its way of going viral back then, right? This photo shows a spirit, apparently, wearing a brown gown. Hence where her name comes from, the Brown Lady of Radom Hall. Just casually floating down a staircase. That's lovely. Imagine seeing this in real life. I'm sweating doing this list. Legend has it that the ghost is that of Dorothy Townshend. She was the sister of Robert Walpole, the first Prime Minister of Britain back in 1676. Some reports say the image is a result of long exposure, just gone awry, but you know, either way, I don't like looking at this photo. So let's move on. Great. Number six, the gates of Guinea. Another bad portal to another bad place. The souls of the dead have to go somewhere, and depending on your beliefs, that somewhere could either be beautiful, it could be peaceful, or it could be uh, absolutely terrifying. Who knows, one of the three. In the world of voodoo, that place is an underworld called the Gates of Guinea. And here is the front door. Yeah, located in Louisiana, this tomb, that of voodoo priestess Marie Lavio, is apparently the entrance to these deep waters, this twilight realm. And some voodoo followers try and open these gates to access the souls of the deep. And apparently the goal after that point would be to use the dead almost like zombies, like your own little personal zombie army. So that's horrible, I guess. Number five, backseat driver. This photo here is from 1959, and it certainly looks like it. It was taken by a lady named Mabel Chinnery, and the photo, at first glance, is just a classic 60s shot of a man in a car. That man was Mabel's husband. Now, the man in the back seat, however, 
We have no idea who that is. Apparently they weren't there in real life. Her husband was the only one in the car at that time. And also, that's a pretty tough angle. If you wanted to recreate this photo with your friends after work, it would be hard. You have to really line something up there. Some Edgar Wright shot has to happen, you know what I mean? It's like he's appearing to us through the seat almost. So either this is a lie, and there was indeed a man sitting in the back left seat, or like Mabel believes, this is her dead mother-in-law. Now if she had said father-in-law, I'd think maybe it's a spirit, but this for sure looks like an older man with a collar. So we don't know. A lot of ghosts just like to hang around. Honestly, Mabel, just see a priest, just to be safe. Number four, ghost pilot. Oh, this one gives me the absolute creeps. I'm hoping it's just a friendly ghost, but really, you never know. I never know. I don't know. I don't want anything to do with any ghost, but sometimes they're friendly, apparently. Any sort of spirit, I don't welcome. There, I said it. The ghost pilot is a photograph that shows a spirit from 1987, when a woman named Mrs. Sayer was visiting an airfield in England. So of course she did the tourist thing and she got a photo in the cockpit, as we all do. Especially now, if you're seeing Top Gun, I'd be like, yo, get a photo of me. But while you're sitting in there getting that tourist photo, do you ever think of who may have sat there before? It's kind of creepy, right? People swear the Titanic was a cursed ship and that spirits were responsible for the ship's bad luck. I personally believe it was the iceberg, but you know, I'm open. Next time you want to sit in the pilot seat, look around for spirits. This image was developed and it appears somebody or something is in the helicopter with Mrs. Sayer. Yeah, nothing like finding out after, eh? Oh. Number three. The Spectre of Newby Church. This one comes from 1963, so it's a little more recent, but even so, this is one of the most convincing on this list, in my humble opinion. Reverend K.F. Lord took this photo in the Newby Church in England. England's a hot spot for ghosts, eh? Damn. And Lord ensures us that this photo is 100% real. I mean, to be fair, it looks like the spirit is facing the camera, so I don't know. It's a great frame, but I'm still believing. The whole Plague Doctor vibe going on here, that's what makes me feel gross here. Anything with Plague Doctors is always giving me the creeps, so I can't even look at this photo. The figure seems to be standing on the first step to the altar, yet somehow it is still taller than the actual altar itself. We think this being, this ghost, is about nine feet tall, so so whoever faked this, if that is the case, they must have been on stilts or something. Also, stilts and a sheet over your face on a staircase? I don't know. That's, I don't think anyone faked this. That's for sure a very tall demon. Drink your milk, then you'll be tall and strong in the afterlife, just like that demon right there. Number two, the Paris Catacombs. As above, so below, is an underrated horror film. It's very good. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. Makes you all sweaty and not nice. In the movie, a team of explorers accidentally go too deep when exploring the Paris catacombs, and in turn, they have to face their own hellish nightmare. I'm not gonna give anything away. Well, this is not too far-fetched, it seems. In what feels like a never-ending maze, the tunnels underneath Paris stretch for hundreds of miles. See, originally, the tunnels were built for Paris stone mines, but near the end of the 18th century, it turned into something a little more haunting. Cemeteries at this point in history were starting starting to fill up. And I mean that in a literal sense, like bodies. It was gross, we didn't know what to do, right? Humans didn't figure out the cleanliness thing for a while, so bodies would be laying on the side of the road. So the solution here was to use these catacombs, right? These tunnels have been there for centuries, so you might as well put them to good use. And by good use, I mean arguably the scariest basement in the world. Just walls of skulls. What could possibly go wrong? So haunted, never going there, so haunted. Do you live in Paris? Have you seen this? Has anyone actually been down there? I wanna hear your account. Comment down below because that's a scary movie, man. That's really not great. And finally, number one, Chernobyl. One of the greatest nuclear disasters ever in history. On April 26, 1986, reactor number four at the Chernobyl power complex exploded due to unstable and low power levels. Reactor four had been shut down a day before due to maintenance, and the next day at 1.23 a.m., radioactive debris compiled the fuel and reactor components just rained down all over the building. It's a nightmare scenario. Toxic fumes were carried from the wind, and after just four months, 28 workers had died due to radiation exposure. Eventually, they had to evacuate over 100,000 residents, and to this day, that zone is a no-go. Number 10, the isolator. The last thing anybody wants to do after the almost, almost two years we've had? Ugh. Though this looks like an object perfect for deep sea diving, it was actually built for desk work. Hugo Gernsback was a Luxembourgish American inventor, writer, editor, engineer, designer, businessman, and of course, magazine publisher because why not add one more thing to the list he's really good at. He started a magazine called Science and Invention which encouraged scientific and amateur experimentation. This was one of the inventions published in the magazine and was revealed in July 1925. The main purpose was to block out all of the noise from the surrounding environment, narrow the field of view like horse blinders to improve concentration. But don't worry, there was an oxygen tube attached to help out the studier, so 
you know you could you could breathe while you're reading about Shakespeare or something. Number nine, kangaroo boxing. Link here. This next one looks pretty self-explanatory, but also it's very confusing at the exact same time. Kangaroo boxing actually became pretty popular in the 1800s. In both Europe and the United States, clowns and professional boxers would square off against marsupials in front of herds of people. It was actually started by a university professor just like as a joke and then it really caught on. Who they cheered for? One can't be certain. The man in the above photograph was sparring against a kangaroo in Germany in 1924. Obviously, the sport did not continue as it was considered abusive to animals who clearly had no idea why this hairless being was all up in their space and trying to beat them up. I don't understand, this is just ridiculous. Number eight, children shipped in the mail. Picture here, sounds ridiculous is ridiculous. But did it happen? Of course it did. However, this picture was actually staged, but this actually did happen. Imagine your sister calling you and telling you your nephew is visiting, and then minutes later the doorbell rings and your nephew is just like chilling with some packing peanuts in a cardboard box. Well, not quite. The postman had to play a kind of babysitter a bit. Shortly after package delivery, a revolutionary thing on its own, was introduced, a couple in Ohio sent their infant son to their grandmother's via post in 1913. It cost 15 cents plus $50 insurance. Once this oddball story got out, the trend caught on. Regulations were vague about what you could and could not send via post, so why take a bus when you could take a postman? Rural townships also usually knew their postman really well, so they'd be like, oh come on Joey, here's 15 cents, take little Timmy to my aunts, I don't know. So they trusted them, they weren't just passing them off to strangers. However, eventually new regulations came out banning the practice, finally, because it's just weird. <laughs> Number six, the cool time traveler. Do you believe in time travel? If your answer is no, maybe this next one, maybe it'll change your mind or keep you open to the concept. It's a common theme in movies, Back to the Future, Loopers, Avengers. Time travel plots are fun, but they're absolute nonsense. Or are they? When we see a case like the Cape Scott story, we can't help but be intrigued a little bit. Time travel or not, this is an interesting photo. It comes from Ray Peterson's book, The Great Cape Scott Story. That book was from 1974, but the actual photo used in the book was taken over 100 years ago. And in the photo, it shows this modern looking guy rocking shorts, maybe jorts, who knows? He has messy morning surfer hair, dippity do three hold, you know, that kind of stuff. He doesn't look like he's from that time period at all. This also has happened more than once, like the time traveling hipster. I don't know, I'm pretty sure it's my cousin. That looks like a guy I know. Definitely not a guy from the 1900s, that's for sure. Number five, skunk ape. This one is exactly what it sounds like. The skunk ape was seen back in 2000, so hopefully, if it's a real thing, it's long gone. Hopefully it's dead by now, it's pretty gross. Two photos were taken of the supposed skunk ape, and this thing looks like Bigfoot's cooler, older cousin, you know? That cousin who has a lava lamp, does kickflips in the garage in October, that kind of cousin, that's the skunk ape, really. An anonymous source sent the Sarasota County Sheriff's Department these photos. They mailed them in, which for starters, that's pretty jarring to receive. Just a creature, just a big foot, put it in the mail. But she claims these photos were taken in her actual backyard and that this creature was not a black bear. It wasn't anything we've seen before. I personally don't think that's a black bear. If anything, it's just a really large, odd looking dog. Those teeth alone are a red flag either way. I want nothing to do with that. Number four, Solway Spaceman caught on photo. Look, we've all been photobombed before. It's a blessing in disguise. You look back at prom photos, some dude sneezing in the background while you're, you know, having the moment of your life. It's the best, we love it. But when Jim Templeton took a photo of his daughter in an otherwise empty marsh, long before Photoshop existed, it appears an astronaut just crashed the family moment. He just had to pop up in the photo in the background. Now Jim assures us that nobody was around, which I believe, otherwise what a weird photo to take in an empty field. I'd be like, hi, get away from my daughter. Just, yeah, 17 meters to the left, thanks. Also the fact that this man looks like he's from space. Yeah, that makes it more believable, no? What are we looking at right now? Who is this? It's so, so creepy. Kodak even got involved in this story, right? Like Kodak, the company Kodak. They confirmed this photo was not tampered with and they know everything. They made Avatar, so they know what's up. Let's run everything by Kodak from now on, deal? Number three, 
Worstead Church Visitor. Okay, time to get a little paranormal. We love those. Hit the lights. Back in 1975, Peter and Diane Berthelot were visiting the Worstead Church in the UK. It was beautiful, right? So like any visitor does, Peter took a photo with his nice Kodak camera, right? He wants to see the truth with his Kodak. Peter took a photo of his lovely wife sitting in this spectacle of a church, but later on, once the photo was developed, somebody else was all of a sudden in the photo now. Or something, we don't really know. Right on the bench behind Diane, there appears to be a person in all white. How calming is that? Maybe it's a wedding, maybe it's their big day. We love it. When the couple went back to the church to ask about who it was, a local suggested they may have gotten photo proof of the white lady, the spirit of a healer who haunts the church. I mean, and as far as surprise ghosts go, that's pretty tame. That's a pretty tame encounter. That's how it should be. Could have been a lot worse. They're like, oh, that's the demon. That's Daryl the demon. Yeah, you don't want any part of that. Number two, Black Knight Satellite. Not to be confused with Martin Lawrence Black Knight. That's, you know, although that's pretty historical and memorable in itself. The Black Knight Satellite is something that has been orbiting our planet for God knows how long. We're guessing thousands of years. Everything else on this list is quite recent, but this myth is ancient. This photo here you've probably seen at one point or another. It was taken back in 1998 during an American mission to the International Space Station. Apparently this guy has been hovering over our Earth just watching us. It's some sort of alien satellite. That's a fun theory, no doubt about it. But during a spacewalk in 1998, one of the thermal covers came loose and drifted away from the station. Could this be that cover that just floated off and wrapped itself around a rock or something? Or it could be an ancient night satellite. One of the two. And finally, number one, the doorbell liquor. Nice, we gotta end with the weirdest thing I've ever seen. This one's short and sweet. Not much explaining to do here, obviously. Does what it says in the can. Back in 2019, a man was caught on surveillance, a doorbell camera, approaching a home in a neighborhood in Salinas, California. He doesn't say much, he just shows up. Doesn't drop off any package, nothing like that. He just shows up and uh, starts licking the doorbell. Not the camera, but the actual doorbell, like the button. He must have rang the bell hundreds of times because he did this for three hours straight. His jaw muscles must be insane. The homeowner said in a following interview after seeing set footage, uh, I quote, oh boy, that is just weird. Yeah, that's what they said to that footage for three hours of a man licking their doorbell. They're like, oh boy, that's weird. Number 10, Amelia Earhart. An American aviation pioneer and celebrated figure in the early 20th century, Amelia Earhart was the first female aviator to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. Notably, in 1932, she became the first woman to fly solo non-stop across the Atlantic Ocean, covering a distance of over 2,000 miles from Newfoundland, Canada to Northern Ireland. Beyond her aviation achievements, Earhart was a prominent advocate for women's rights. She encouraged women to pursue careers and goals that were traditionally considered to be male-dominated. Earhart was also an author and a, pub and a popular public speaker, which I wish I could do, and she wrote several books about her experience in aviation and women's issues. In this photo, what seems to be a normal photo of Amelia is actually the last photo we have of her before she went missing. She may have survived her round-the-world attempt only to be later captured by Japanese forces. According to a newly discovered photograph, and according to the New History Channel documentary, the photo is found in a National Archive file as it has shown Earhart alive after her plane fell low on fuel during her mission. The photo depicts a woman believing to be Earhart and a man who looked like her navigator, Fred. A Japanese ship can be seen in the background, carrying what appears to be her plane, as her fate has been debated for decades and has sparked several conspiracy theories. Mona, what do you guys think? Are people just hopeful? Number 9. Volcano We all love a good nature tour or park hike, but for this man, David Johnston, he really loved the nature of volcanoes and geology, and ultimately pursued his education in the field. He was working with the US Geological Survey at the Cascades Volcano Observatory in Vancouver, Washington, and he was assigned to monitor the activity of Mount St. Helens, a stratovolcano that had been showing recently a lot of activity. This photo is when he was doing his research on the earthly giant, but tragically on May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted explosively, triggering a massive landslide and a pyroclastic flow. David Johnston was stationed at the observation post on the ridge known as Coldwater 2, about six miles north of the volcano. He radioed in the now famous message, Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it, to his colleagues at the USGS headquarters, alerting them to the eruption. Regrettably, Johnston's post was directly in the path of the advancing pyroclastic flow and he perished in the eruption alongside with many others. His body was unfortunately never recovered and he was only 30 years old. Number 8, the 1986 Challenger. I love space and I think space is really amazing and cool as so did these guys, the crew members of the Challenger. Francis R. Scooby, Michael J. Smith, Ronald McNair, Ellison Onizuka, Judith Resnick, Gregory Jarvis, and Christina McAuliffe. 
The Challenger mission was unique because it included Christina, a civilian school teacher who was selected to be the first private citizen to fly in space as part of NASA's Teacher in Space program. However, the Challenger suffered a massive disaster when the failure of an O-ring seal in the right solid rocket booster. Cold temperatures in the morning of the launch weakened the O-ring's elasticity, allowing hot gases to escape and damage the external fuel tank, leading to an explosion that was witnessed by millions of people around the world, and it was a devastating blow to NASA and the space program. Following the disaster, the space shuttle program was suspended for over two years, and significant changes were made to the shuttle's design and launch protocols. After its investigation, the disaster also led to a renewal focus on the importance of safety in human spaceflight. Number seven, mummies for sale. Considering the frenzy that people get into when archaeologists discover a new mummy, you might be surprised to learn that this picture is actually a street merchant selling mummy merchandise of actual actual mummy. During the Victorian era in the 1800s, Napoleon's conquest opened the gates of Egypt to the Europeans, making mummies a really hot commodity. Like imagine somebody bury like uh, uncovering your aunt and going, "Ooh, we could sell her." Weird, right? Like 1000 years from now, they could be purchased from street vendors just as you see from this photo. The Euro elite used to even have mummy unwrapping parties, which is exactly as it sounds and not what you would expect people to do with a corpse. But even weirder than that, people actually thought ground up mummies had medicinal properties. It was so popular that it even instigated a counterfeit trade to meet the massive demand for magic mummy ground stuff. What did the counterfeit trade involve? The flesh of beggars instead of mummies. All that behind one picture. Number six. Half and half. This next one actually has a kind of sad story behind it, but paints a very clear picture of the division between Catholics and Protestants and actually just religion in general. This picture depicts two graves in the Netherlands, one belonging to a Protestant and the other a Catholic. In 1842, a 22-year-old Catholic noblewoman fell passionately in love with a 33-year-old commoner, a colonel in the cavalry who was also Protestant, a big no-no. Their marriage was a total scandal, but they said screw you to their peers and stayed together for 40 years. The woman's husband died in 1880 and to forever unite them, she built a grave that would forever keep them together even though they were apart by a wall. The old cemetery was strictly divided into Catholic, Protestant and Jewish sections, so these two monuments were built so they could forever be together. Does anybody have a tissue? Number 5. Leo the Lion. Believe it or not, you've seen this lion before. In fact, you've probably seen him many times while watching your favorite films as a kid and even now. The lion in the photo is the one, the only, Leo the Lion, the majestic beast who roars the MGM logo, like the old one. Leo the Lion was the regular star of MGM since since it was founded in 1924. The first MGM lion was called Slats, not Leo, and he actually didn't roar. He was just kind of like looking around. It was more like a gif. But Leo is actually the most familiar roar. Like everybody knows what he sounds like. But who is the man having tea with such a lion? Well, that of course is Alfred Hitchcock, the king of thrills. This photo was taken in 1957 of the two legends posing to enjoy a hot cup of British tea. Number four, Walter Yeo. Though the picture itself is a little disturbing, it signifies a life changing moment for Mr. Walter Yeo and also for thousands more. This was one of the world's first plastic surgery procedures. Walter Yeo had suffered a dreadful accident while manning the guns on the HMS Warspite during World War One. He lost both his upper and lower eyelids in the event. A year later, however, he met Sir Harold Gillies, who would be considered the father of plastic surgery. His idea was to take skin from another part of Yeo's body and place it over the area in like a mask like shape, as you can see in the photo. Dr. Gillies then went on to carry out the surgery on 5,000 injured men from June 1917 onward. And thanks to his work, thousands of people have benefited since the years of the war. Yeo himself lived in until he was 70 years old. Number three, the Dynosphere. The car of the future that really never made it there, and we can see why. Every car we have today has four wheels, not just one. Some have more than that now, it's getting confusing. But in the 1930s, J.H. Purvis had a vision. He called it the Dynosphere. It was a large wheel with a cabin in the center for the driver and the passenger to sit. Funny enough, it did actually work. Check this out. But did anyone else notice the problem with driving it? Yeah. 
you have to drive like Ace Ventura with his window open because it broke. You know what I mean? That scene? Exactly. In order to see past the giant wheel spinning in front of you, you have to kind of rubber neck it out to the side. JH made two prototypes. One ran on gasoline and the other ran on electricity. He even designed a kind of bus version that could fit more passengers, but it still needed mini stabilizer wheels, so it had like six by the end of it. Do I kind of want one though? Because it looks fun? Absolutely. Would I want to take it on a road trip across Canada? Absolutely not. Number two, the Hindenburg disaster. Based off the title, you already know that this is a picture of the Hindenburg disaster because I already said it. Spoiler alert. The Hindenburg was the largest dirigible ever built and it was the pride of World War II. You don't see Germany, you know which one I'm talking about. The, but YouTube gets mad. The first successful airship was constructed in 1852 by Henry Giffard, but the problem was he used hydrogen. This made both French and German designs of the craft susceptible to explosions if something went wrong. Hence, exhibit A. What you are seeing in the photo is the direct aftermath of a devastating accident. Um, on May 6, 1937, the dirigible touched a mooring mast in Lakehurst, New Jersey, sparking the explosion, which took the lives of 13 passengers and 21 crew members. Something as simple as a small spark from the engine ignited the hydrogen core, and the craft fell 200 feet to the ground in flames. And last but not least, number one, spectators. This is the photo taken at the trial of Al Capone. Yeah, it suddenly makes a lot of sense as to why people are covering their faces. When someone says to you 1930s gangster, Al Capone probably jumps into your head. He was deemed public enemy number one by the US government for bootlegging and other illegal rackets during prohibition. The terror the ruthless gangster incited in the city of Chicago is evident by this image. Witnesses and spectators of the trial covered their faces so they wouldn't be recognized by Capone's vengeful accomplices or Capone himself. Behind those fedoras may lie other criminals yet to be unmasked, or civilians scared of a Tommy gun waking them up at night. Either way, you know he must have been one terrifying dude. Authorities did everything they could to catch him, but he would always slip right through their fingers. Finally, his reign came to an end in 1931 when they caught him on income tax evasions of all things that landed him an eight year sentence. Starting off with S for secrets. Alrighty, so here is from the Polish Constitution Day celebration in Chicago, specifically the one from 1978. On the left there, all washed out and crappy old flash display style is First Lady Rosalind Carter. The guy shaking her hand, or rather just holding it and staring off camera like a waiter just went pie with a tray of warm sausage rolls he wants to really get into is John Wayne Gacy. And if you're also thinking, yo, what is up with this guy being in so many random famous photos, you're absolutely right and it's genuinely strange how photographed and out there Gacy was. By the time this was taken, he had already killed over 20 people. Also, when he wasn't side hustling as a clown, he was super active in the government and politics, thus why wearing the S on the lapel. It was given to him by the Secret Service to indicate special security clearance, so the S literally does stand for secrets both the US government and his own. Whose secrets are worse though, huh? Huh? Anyways, at the bottom of the handshake photo, you can see the handwritten address to John Gacy, best wishes, Rosalind Carter. I've heard beauty is pain, but I haven't heard beauty is the next Saw movie? Check out the beauty calibrator. Seeing pictures, you may think it's some sort of middle ages torture machine, or as said, literally one of those Saw movie head devices. But surprisingly not, it's another way to point out women's insecurities and find the smallest things possible to make them feel bad over. Meet the Max Factor beauty calibration machine. It is the only one in existence thank God, and in 1932, the makeup legend Max Factor came up with this ingenious invention combining fearonology, cosmetics, and insecurity gaslighting with pseudoscience analysis of a woman's physical flaws. Max Factor's beauty calibrator enabled Hollywood makeup artists to pinpoint where facial corrections needed to be made down to a literal fraction. The machine, also known in the trades as the beauty micrometer, revealed that a natural perfect face was a myth. Every single woman was imperfect and needed correction, and this machine could find it by taking precise measures. It would mark spots that needed to be fixed and then the artist, once the helmet was removed, could correct all the new insecurities with makeup that you didn't have before you put the stupid thing on. Next up is a photo that's all dramatic flair, the death card. Masseria represented an outdated mindset in the mafia world, one that could no longer be reasoned with diplomatically. The same is true of his rival Maranzano. The ongoing tit for tat killing between the two genuinely wreaked havoc on not only the streets but in the mafia hierarchy itself. 
yourself. Those resistant to change generally don't last long. And meetings of the Mafia elite tried to bring around at the end of bloodshed, but Mirandano especially consistently manipulated matters to his own advantage. In order to facilitate underworld peace, the consensus turned from diplomacy to the inevitable. One of these guys had to go. The final straw, according to the account of Nicola Gentile, was when the police informants called Masiri and said knock off the violence. Having an idealism for peace, he actually responded by disarming his men, and they were all pissed. Joe the boss, Masiria, his bodyguards, and Lucky Luciano all met at a seafood restaurant at 3 p.m. on April 15th of 1931. Luciano excuses himself from the card game while that they're playing to visit the bathroom. This is the signal for the hitmen. The bangs could be heard from around the block, apparently, as Joe was hit from behind four times in the back and one in the head. And it's Born, the infamous Ace of Spades shot. It added to the cult status of this hit, but many expect that the Ace of Spades card was placed between Mysterious Fingers after the hit by a photographer just for the shock factor of the press. Number 7 Menendez Brothers We're all fans of something, whether it's art, music, or sports, and for the Menendez Brothers, they would be so excited to see that they happen to be in the photo card. But the most disturbing part of this photo is the fact that these two killed their parents before the photo was even taken. They went on a six month spending binge with their money. The case was so shocking to the media, including how after the deaths occur, the brothers went to watch James Bond's License to Kill and tried to use it as an alibi. How a week prior, their mother confided to her therapist that she was worried that her sons were psychopaths and how one brother brought an entire chicken wing restaurant with the parents money after they had passed away. Their father was an executive in the entertainment industry and both went into private schools and the older brother Lyle was briefly enrolled in Princeton. After two deadlocked juries, LA prosecutors retired the brothers in a courtroom that did not allow cameras and the new jury found them guilty on two counts of the first degree. They were sentenced by the judge to life in prison. Number 6 Aquino Filipino people have been known to fight resistance against paralysis and oppressors as that seems to be all of our history to be composed of, and that is the truth. And for Ninoy Aquino, he was opposing threat as the political activist against the long dictatorship and assailant of the martial law, Fernandez Marcos. He tried to run for president in 1973, but then Marcos declared martial law in 1972, preventing him to run. Benigno Aquino, or as we know by his nickname, Ninoy Aquino, was imprisoned by the Marcos regime for speaking out against him where he was locked in prison and tormented for seven years. It wasn't until he suffered a heart attack did Marcos' wife Emilda allowed him to go to the United States to get treatment, only under the condition that he does not come back home to the Philippines. But Aquino knew that his love for the people and the Philippines was more important as there were many people wrongfully prosecuted or just be found dead on the street for protesting against Marcos. He did plan to go back and before he arrived to the Philippines, he warned reporters, hey, this might be the last time you ever actually speak to me, and he was right. In this photo was the photo before he left the plane out towards the Philippines airport. He kept saying he had a bulletproof vest on, but the assailant shot him in the head. There were countless reporters that day that knew something was going on, only for them to be all shocked to see his body on the ground. There's even footage of his assassination on Line, and his death sparked an outrage throughout all of the Philippines asking for justice. But of course, the United States always has to get involved in something, and they were able to get the Marcos family out of persecution from the very people he tormented and controlled for years. Number 5, Tyler Hadley. Everyone likes a good party selfie, including Tyler Hadley, who we can see here drinking a party cup with some friends. But what they don't know is that if they walked into the master bedroom was the killed bodies of his parents that he ended moments before the party. Tyler allegedly decided how he wanted to commit the crime a few weeks prior to committing them. He often told a friend exactly exactly what he was planning to do at the time, noting that having a big party after a parasite had never been done before. Shortly after noon, Tyler wrote on his Facebook wall, party at my crib tonight, maybe. Around 60 people attended the party at that night and several had alleged to have noticed the smell of dead bodies. Gross. During the party, Tyler apparently told several people about what he had done. Tyler went on a short walk with a friend and Michael Mandel and confessed the crime. After returning to the party, Mandel discovered the bodies of Blake and Mary Jo in the master bedroom. Mandel did not leave the party immediately. In fact, he had continued to spend hours with Tyler and even took a selfie with him, which is what we see. Four hours later, Mendel left the party and called the local crime hotline to report the incident, which is pretty smart on his end because if he did something, then you know Tyler would have done something to him. News of the crime was then spread by word of mouth and Haley was arrested early in the next morning. Number four, Tank Man. When it comes to revolution, all it takes is one person. After all, a single grain of rice can tip the scale. The Tank Man photograph was taken on the morning of the 5th of June, 1989, the day after the Chinese government had violently suppressed protests in Tainan. Men Square. An estimated 10,000 civilians were killed in the massacre following weeks of a student led demonstration in Beijing and beyond against the communist regime and the suppression of basic human rights and freedom of expression. The image captures a lone man standing in the middle of the Chang and Avenue just off the square facing down a column of four slowly advancing Type 59 tanks of the Chinese army in a defiant protest. The identity of the tank man still remains anonymous as people don't know what happened to him after, but he has been noted as a notable figure in the stance against militia harm to the people. Number three, Jolie. Kellen. 
When it comes to love, if you know something is off, listen to your gut and be safe first. Unfortunately for Jolie, she only left one memory to a friend that something ever happened to her, they know who the cause was. In 2015, 18 year old Jolie Kalen was hiking with her ex boyfriend Lauren Bunner when he photographed her on a cliff before he pushed her off of it. The 20 year old killer nearly escaped justice by claiming he was on the autism spectrum in court. This is the exact photo before he pushed her off. Bunner later called the cops and said, I just want to turn myself in for the crime of my ex girlfriend that happened just a little while ago on Cheheha Mountain. Later Later that evening, on August 30th, 2015, police found her body still wearing her backpack. Cops believed that he had lured Callahan, who still wanted to remain friends with her former boyfriend, there to kill her because she wouldn't take him back. The court heard him bragging to cellmates about killing the 18 year old, saying if he couldn't have her, no one else could. Number 2. Omeg if you're lucky, you may have had some cute outing photos with your family and friends when you were younger and this particular photo seems like an ordinary day with a young girl and her dad, but unfortunately it was actually moments before an explosion incident caused by the real IRA or the real Irish Republic Army. A provincial Irish Republican Army splinter group who opposed the IRA ceasefire and the Good, day Friday, and the Good Friday Agreement signed earlier that year. The explosion killed 29 people and injured about 220 others. The red Vauxhall Calvier containing the bomb, I can't say, can I say bomb? The red, Volkswagen, the red Vauxhall Calvier containing the explosion, this photograph was taken shortly before the explosion, and the camera was found afterwards in the rubble. The man and the child in the photo both survived, and the injured survivor, Marion Radford, described hearing an unearthly bang followed by eeriness, a darkness that had just come over the place, then screams as she saw bits of bodies, limbs on the ground while she searched for her 16 year old son. Alan. She learned. She later discovered he had been killed yards away from her after the two became separated just minutes before the blast. And finally, number one, Andes. Personally, one of the most creepiest photo, and it actually made me feel pretty uncomfy with this one. Seems like a cool crew cut photo of just a bunch of dudes. When in reality, these are the survivors of an Air Force Flight 571 crash in the Andes. Pilot Fer Ferardas had flown across the Andes 29 times previously, and on this flight, he was training a co-pilot, La Guara, who was at the controls. As they flew through the Andes. These clouds obscured the mountains, and the controller in Santiago, unaware the flight was still over the Andes, authorized him to descend to 11,500 feet. The rugby players on board joked about the turbulence at first until some passengers saw that the aircraft was very close to the mountain. That was probably the moment when the pilots saw the Black Ridge rising dead ahead. After the crash, of the 45 people on the aircraft, three passengers and two crew members of the tail section were killed when it broke apart. The survivors had little food, only 8 chocolate bars, a tin of mussels, 3 small jars of jam, a tin of almonds, a few dates, candies, dried plums, and several bottles of wine. Eventually their friends made an agreement that if they ever died, they would offer themselves for them to eat, and so they did. The group survived by collectively deciding to eat flesh from the bodies of their dead comrades, and in the photo you can see on the right, a spine. At the end, 8 people were rescued and they lived. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot we have the Mad Bomber. This is a photo that was taken of someone known as the Mad Bomber. His real name is George Metzky, and he was the man who terrorized New York City for 16 years while he planted explosives in public places like an absolute psychopath. I guess he was apparently angry about a workplace injury he had suffered in the years prior to his terrible crimes, and so of course the normal reasonable jump to make would be um, not that at all. While no one should have ever had to suffer because of these crimes, the good news is that while he planted 33 bombs and set off 22 of them, miraculously only 15 people ended up injured in the end. This photo of him behind bars is extremely eerie thanks to his creepy smile and haunting eyes. I might be the only one who feels it, but it just seems like something's off. You know? In our number 9 spot today, we have the figures of the fire. This photo is both extremely unsettling and super captivating as it shows a scene after the great fire at Madame Tussauds in 1925. Of course, this wax museum is famous for the extremely lifelike wax figures that are created and find their home there, so you can only imagine the aftermath of the fire. These lifelike figures with missing heads and appendages, burnt skin and hair, and just clothing in disarray. Seeing this photo for the first time without knowing the story behind it was definitely a bit of a confusing and terrifying experience. The heads on the ground really freaked me out for a full 5 seconds. As scary as it is, I'm glad to hear it's not real and just some creative casualties rather than what this photo appears to be at first. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Spectre. This is a photo that was taken in England in 
1963, and it became known as the Specter of the Newbie Church. That is, of course, because of the ghostly figure that can be seen in the photo. I personally am always a little suspicious of ghost photos. Some are certainly more convincing than others, but Photoshop in 1963 wasn't exactly as accessible and easy as it is now. This photo is said to have been taken by Reverend K. F. Lord inside of the Newbie Church, which is located in North Yorkshire, England. Of course, I mean like many of us are going to do. People were really skeptical of this apparition and just believed it was a well done case of double exposure, which to be fair, is entirely possible. The Reverend continued to swear up and down however that the photo was not doctored, so at this point, there's no proof to prove either side and it's just a game of he said she said. So what do you guys think? Apparition caught slipping or is the Reverend just making it up? Next is a series of photos recovered before they could be lost. Holes in a window. Former LAPD reserve officer turned photographer Merrick Morton was faffing around in the LA police department when he comes across a stash of LAPD crime photos ranging in the dates of 1920s all the way to the 1970s. These were cellulose nitrate based film and the negatives were so decomposed they're deemed fire hazard. But Merrick saw enough of the few stills to know that they'd be an absolute effing gold mine. Working with Phototech and Photo Digitation Service and the US National Film Archive, the photos were given a new life. This collection is NSFW and there are hundreds. Now spruced up, the macabre photos are mostly crimes and many of them violent and depicting the bodies or surviving victims injuries. Obviously the ones you're seeing on screen as I'm talking are tamer, such as my choice the one you're seeing now, holes in the car window. Something about it gives me a deep sense of discomfort, thus the choice. The collection contains recognizable crimes and faces too, an unusual photo of Malaya Nurmi dressed as Vampira, pictures of comedian Lenny Bruce's OD in March of 1966, and images of the Manson family arriving at their arrangement in 1970. Every photo is scary and every single has a disturbing backstory. Some captions are provided by author James Elroy in his book LAPD 53. You can win, but sometimes you still lose in the end. It's the devastated Disney's. Meet Howard Ashman and Alan Menken. There are some everyday photos of these two in their prime. Who were they? In case you couldn't tell by all the Disney crap in the background of said photos, they played somewhat of a big role. You know, writing the lyrics and music for Oliver and Company, The Little Mermaid, Aladdin, and Beauty and the Beast as well as a few others. Also not to mention creating the Little Shop of Horrors, which got them hired by Disney in the first place. And in this photo you see now, they had just won the Oscars for The Little Mermaid. Hooray! But why does Ashman look so unhappy? This was his life's accomplishments. It's because that night Ashman told Menken they needed to have a serious talk when they got back to New York. And when they get back a few days later, Ashman admits that he has HIV that's quickly progressed and he's going to die soon. And fast. They had been songwriting partners for over a decade and were in the middle of working on Beauty and the Beast and despite the illness, Ashman completed the lyrical work and the initial work on Aladdin. On the morning of March 14, 1991, he does die from heart failure caused by his condition. At the time of his death, he only weighed 80 pounds, he'd lost his sight and could barely speak, and a voice that spoke so eloquently through song was lost forever. Before he passed, however, Disney Productions scrambled to finish the film so he could see a screening of it. The film earned Ashman and Menken three 1991 Academy Award nominations for Best Song and the title song winning the award. Perhaps most amazingly, Beauty and the Beast was the first animated film ever nominated for an Academy Award for Best Motion Picture. So it looks like a photo of two men achieving their wildest dreams, but it's a record of their last normal moment together. Oh look, it's the D-Bags Day Off! Camp staff! Check out this jolly go lucky group. They got the day off of work because the weather was nice for the first time in a long time. During the wartime that must have been awesome, especially being young. Finally shirk responsibility, maybe go get a pint, have a picnic, hang out with each other, maybe get a little frisky, lavishing in the sun. I'm done looking at them. In fact I'm sick by having to look at them. When that group of people is going to have lighted and silly summer fun on a day off, they're going back to their jobs at the camps of World War II. To do exactly what you're thinking they would be doing for work when I say they work at the camps of World War II. And they enjoyed it. This wasn't one of those mandatory war jobs or excuses you can make up for following orders. These young adults who may as well be the grandmothers, grandfathers, or great grandma or pa of people even watching chose to do this job and actively enjoyed it. So this is a good reminder it's not that far in the past and these people most likely took lives shortly before or after this photo was taken. Uh, did Halloween come early or is it just Sylvester Claus? Yes, so uh, 
um, I chose this photo out of trust me like thousands of equally creepy ones because I feel it truly captures the what the bleep factor this holiday has. And they do it every 31st of December to 13th of January. The Sylvester Clausen of Ernach and the surrounding area Appenzell Custom that is famous throughout Switzerland. The custom derives its charm from the unique blending of contrasts such as nature and art, mystery and tradition, harmony and anarchy. The Sylvester Clause that ushered the old year out and ring in the new. There are three types of these clauses. The beautiful, the ugly, and the pretty ugly. Common to all the clauses are bells in various shapes and sizes that they wear on their bodies. Their rituals begin in the early morning each day. The various shupal meet at the village square before each group goes its own way. A group will pull up in front of your house, then hop around and jump up and down to make the bells ring, and then they start yodeling at you. You listen to the yodel, they say happy new year, give you some cash, some liquor you have to drink from a straw, and then they just leave. Dark backstory gossip however, in times of poverty and hunger which afflicted the region frequently, Clausen was a way to earn a little extra money and in the 1930s what was known as Belchel Claus aka the beggar Claus began to appear on the streets. Essentially homeless Santa Clauses, but Santa looked like that. As a result the influx of beggars in the Claus guide resulted in heavy restrictions and in the 1950s the custom had nearly died out. It's only thanks to the initiative of individuals in the 1970s that this got to come back and enjoys enormous popularity today. Somebody come get their creepy uncle. Cannot tell me this isn't the energy this photo gives. Creepy uncle. The woman is unidentified, but definitely a follower to be able to handle that guy's BO and greasy hands on her. It was taken of the Children of God leader, David Berg. This group started in 1968 in California after Berg claimed God himself had gifted him with prophecies. In reality, Berg started making extreme demands of his followers, give up their money, worldly possessions in exchange for limited outside access horrible cramped living conditions, brainwashing, and oh yeah, a b would make this group famous for really bad reasons I can't and would rather not get into. Former members of COG have been outspoken about the childhood they suffered growing up in the communes. Actress Rose McGowan, the most famously outspoken, published her story of nine years in the group. Actors Joaquin and River Phoenix, also raised in the cult, had it harder than Rose, and that trauma plagued River especially. He was actually the original heartthrob of the 80s and 90s, a role, fun fact, DiCaprio only managed to take once River's substance addiction caused by his traumatic childhood unfortunately took his life. So more of an unfun fact, but the matter stands that River painted the way for DiCaprio and this psycho ruined a lot of people's lives. Have you ever seen a photo you can feel? Before you see the photo itself, you're going to learn about the man in it. So Joseph Goebbels, a national socialist politician and propagandist who held multiple high rank roles in the uh, Yahtzee party. As a party chief for Greater Berlin, 1926 to 45, Reich leader of propaganda, 1929 to 45. And in 1933, the push broom mustache twit appointed Joseph the Minister for Propaganda and Public Enlightenment. He was a devout and brittle through and through bigot, a tireless agitator, and the propaganda this man designed, wrote, and funded had shipped through dozens of countries and shaped the perspective of Jews in a way that can actually never be undone. It's this propaganda many people still cite when asked for factual basis or logical argument as what Jews had done oh so wrong. It's Joseph who orders the mass burning of literature, who sentenced thousands to death and who made up lies to ensure hatred, a hatred that still stands today. And I want you guys to see how he looked at them. So here is the photo, finally. This is a picture of Joseph Goebbels taken only seconds after he found out the photographer was Jewish. In this photo, you can feel it. And it's effing terrifying. And now, the last photo is from El Monte, 6 May. That's the date written on this photo from the LAPD Collective. And it's the only other photo from said collection I chose to put on this list aside from the holes in the car window. Window. As follows is the photo and James L. Roy's written description of it. This is a detective modeling a mask worn by Baxter Shorter's crew. Shorter was in a gaggle with Emmett Perkins, Jack Santos, and Barbara Graham. The three of them then killed an old woman named Mabel Monahan on 9 March 1953. Shorter was appalled by his gaggle's violence. He ratted the others out and Santo and Perkins kidnapped him in front of his pad on Bunker Hill, took him to the mountains, and killed him. Shorter had a sister that lived in El Monte and they were hunting through it for evidence. This mask was in her pad. James Elroy. If Mabel Monahan's former son-in-law Tudor Scherer hadn't been a Las Vegas gambler, the 60-year-old widow probably
probably would have never been killed. Also, if she didn't stay friends with him after he divorced her daughter, that'd probably have helped. But she did, and people found that weird. So there had to be something at play, right? Maybe Cher or trusted her so much he stored his 100 grand floats there. Ex-cons Emmett Perkins, John True, and Jack Santos think that, and they plan to take it. Barbara Graham joins the group to be their key into the door. Mabel takes a while to open up, but Barbara persuades her with the story of a broken down car and pleas for the phone. Mabel was reluctant, but the young woman was alone, and the widow knew firsthand how scary it could be for a woman to be on her own at night, so she let her in. And in comes John True, Jack, Emmett, wearing rubber masks. We're gonna take a pause. Ladies and female presenters, our own sex does not guarantee our safety, and you can't predict anyone's intentions. Please trust your gut if it says don't open that door. Mabel is struck on the head, left gagged and bleeding in the hallway. The group ransacks her home for a safe that never exists and panic when there is none, so they just leave her there. Mabel is dead for two days in her home before she's found. The investigation into the slaying of the Burbank widow began, and it was a long one, filled with drama. In the end, the four are charged with conspiracy to commit burglary, robbery, and M-word on June 3rd, 1953, in the death of Miss Mabel Monahan.